Welcome to the 2022 Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, our 35th anniversary, presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. You're about to learn from some of the top saltwater anglers in the country. Now, the key to getting the most in the seminar series is to listen to the little subtleties, the adjustments that we are doing when the fishing is tough. This is what we like to refer to as the golden nuggets of the seminar series. We're about ready to get underway, so let's get right down to it. Coming to you from the IGFA in South Florida, it's the 35th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Now, here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the 2022 Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats and filmed at the International Game Fish Association, the televised version. We're gonna jump right into an exciting panel on flute. But first, I wanna introduce the all-star panel to my far left. He's out of the Tampa Bay area, an outstanding inshore angler who catches his fair share of fluke, which is called Southern Flounder down here. The one, the only, Captain Mike Goodwine. Next to Mike, out of New Jersey, most of her fishing is in South Jersey waters. When it comes to catching tog, fluke, striped bass, she's definitely an ace at it. That's Melissa Toro. And sitting right next to me, also out of the South Jersey area, longtime pal, he does it all from the inshore to the offshore fishing out of Jersey, Maryland, throughout the Bahamas, the one, the only, Captain Joe Trainer. Well, glad to have everybody here. And first, I need to sort of qualify this session. It's called Fluke, which is basically the left-eyed flounder, not to be confused with the right-eyed flounder, which is the winter flounder. So Fluke is basically the left-eyed flounder as you get farther south it is known as a southern flounder. So if you hear Mike or myself referring to flounder, we really mean the southern flounder, which is basically close enough to the fluke to make this the session. All right, Melissa, I'm gonna start off with you. You do a lot of your fishing in South Jersey waters, and fluke is a, a species that I've always been intrigued with because we don't get that many of them down here. So what are the right conditions, and maybe you give me the time of the year when you see these fluke more near the inshore and what are some of the conditions that, as far as bottom composite, that say, you know, we're going to be able to catch some here? Yeah, sure. So we'll start seeing fluke migrating into the back bays, the rivers, around springtime. I would say around the April, May uh, time frame. We're looking at water temperatures back there. I'm always looking for around 60 degrees or higher. That's when they start kind of ambushing baits and they become a little bit more active. Um, what I'm looking for in conditions, especially like in the back bays, I am looking for, well, let's go back to tides. Mm -hmm. When it comes to tides, an outgoing tide, I'll find them in the shallows or in the muddy flats. But in an incoming tide, I'll target the, ch the channel edges. And that's where I'll find them. Okay, so good information. So I've, based on what you're saying there, moving water is pretty much crucial to getting them uh, the strike or could you get them on slack water periods? Yeah, so that's what I thought, maybe moving water. But here's a, this is where I really seceded last year. So it is slack tide. Um, it is low slack tide. I am not getting any hits in the back bays at all. What I decided to do was you know, we do a lot of jigging mm -hmm. with our, our bucktails and everything. And what I did was I would cast across like a shallow, you know, area of water, some muddy flats, and I would cast from my boat or from my jet ski, I would cast away and I would jig slowly back, retrieving it. And lo and behold, this is slack tide. Water temperature now is around 70 degrees. It's kind of like the end of the summer. So they're kind of heading out to the ocean. And I was just killing them, <laughs> getting all these keepers, which is anything above in New Jersey, above 18 inches. Gotcha. So that was something that I really seceded in last year, all catching right. these flukes. I'm out of Jersey, and I'm listening to you, and I got my Simrad machine. I'm trying to look at the bottom. What is a good fluke bottom? I'm looking for mud. Am I looking for mud mixed with rocks? What's going to tell me I got some good current? This looks like it holds fluke. What is it? I mean, yeah, you're looking for mud, but
but let's say towards the end of the summer, they start moving offshore. So I'll start going offshore and I'll start looking at some wrecks or some reefs. So I'm looking at like some rocky edges along the bottom and I'll fish right outside of those edges okay. and I'll drift. I'll drift. Hopefully you're looking for a drift speed of um, around anywhere from point seven to 1.2. And that's what I'm looking for on my sim rack. Okay, so it's, it's a game of edges pretty much too, just like it fishing is, in yes. general. And or, those muddy flats and those shallows, gotcha. but that's more of the back base. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and Joe, you're the offshore guy. I'm, I, I'm presuming, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that a lot of your fluke fishing is offshore? Yeah, we uh, do a little bit in the beginning. We'll do a little bit in the back, but uh, not much, but usually it'll be getting back from the Bahamas and then starting at the reefs, you know. And, 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 and when do you start seeing the fluke moving to the offshore in, in fishable numbers that you could target them? Late June, July 4th. We always say July 4th is usually the start of it some, somewhere. It all depends on the how warm of a June we had, you mm -hmm. know, and how warm the back bays heat up and then they move out to get to, you know, the reefs and everything else, which would be four to nine miles offshore or something like that, okay. depending on which one. Now, offshore, a much larger area. What do you look in terms of bottom structure? Well, we, we typically like to fish like uh, the old Ben Franklin bridge rubble that was knocked down in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. It's a very great bottom. You lose a lot of rigs, but it's really good for us. We're in a big boat, so we tend to go a lot faster than the back bay boats. So we usually stem the current and back into the current and try to hold them over the ground so we lose less rigs and we're over the gotcha. productive hold, bottom. Hold that thought. We're going after commercial break. We jump right back into this. I want to grow yep. even more on identifying bottom structure even more prominently. We right back with the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, the Fluke Panel. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. Penn, let the battle begin. Sirius XM Marine, weather, fish mapping, and entertainment for anglers. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 35th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sports and National Seminar Series. The topic, fluke. I'm with Joe Trainer, who sails out of Southern Jersey, and we're dealing with locating fluke in the types of bottom structure. Now give me a, an approximation of the depth, and what are you looking for in terms of actual bottom structure? You, you mentioned wrecks, but what about the bottom itself? Is it all about wrecks, or do you find this? I really like the rocks, you okay. know, because it's a bigger, usually typically, you know, we're a bigger boat, so we like the bigger area. So if I can find rocks, rubbles, the reef balls that they've put down there, gives us a longer drift, gives people more time to get set up, and you can actually, you know, get make maybe four or five drops over you know, a mile area. Try to get, we try to get the longest area to drift before we need to relocate. Uh, and which you, you gave me a good point that I want to elaborate on here in a second. The, you know, the drifting versus anchoring deal. You mentioned drifting, but I want to go to Mike. Mike, Tampa Bay, and I've seen you with some pretty big flounders, we call them down here too. Now I know you're redfish, snook, you know, tarp and triple tail. That, that's pretty much your bag. Now, in your area there, if somebody charted you, take me out, I want to catch some Flounder, where are you gonna go? What are you gonna look for? For, uh, we probably gonna go to Walmart or the <laughs> grocery store. But, uh, we catch, I catch flounder um, mostly by mistake inshore. But when I do target them, I go out to the shipping channels and it's around from 40 to 50 feet deep. Mm -hmm. And I just look for rocks, drop a, um, a one ounce knocker rig on the bottom and that's how we catch them. And I learned that by trying to catch snapper. We started catching flounder. So I was like, anybody want to go on a, on a flounder charter, we're going to go fish for snapper and hope we catch a flounder. <laughs> okay, so you're fishing a channel. Is there any time of the year that you might see those fish more abundant or are they pretty much spotty throughout the year and it relies more on luck and, and being in that zone to have a shot at them? Uh, it's normally always during the summertime. Okay. No. And it's right in the shipping channel. So uh, once I start seeing a bunch of bar riders and jet skis, no offense, <laughs> I know it's flounder time. Cause everybody out, all the people that's out cruising around. And uh, so the, the middle of the summertime, like June, July, yeah. and they're gonna be on the bottom in the rocks. Uh, I'm usually fishing cut bait. I cut piece of green bites, pilchards, shiners or whatever you call it. 
and with a split shot. Uh, what, what, what size like hook, is there a, a leader involved uh, in this? One out hook, I, I use 25 pound leader for everything, 10 pound braid. Gotcha. Melissa, are you more of a jigging enthusiast? Are you more of dropping down either live bait or cut bait on there? Is, is there a time where they seem to prefer one versus the other? I mean, you have to play around with it. So definitely jigging. I never dead stick, which is just dropping and just letting it drift. Okay. I'm always, in, like, I'm just enticing some kind of action. So it's jigging, whether it's rapid or maybe some nice, like, like swift action of my wrist and everything like that. When it comes to baits, I have a rig here if you'd like to see it over here very quickly. In a second I in am, because we're gonna get ready to jump to commercial break on it too. Okay. So, so primarily you prefer the jigging part I prefer of it. the jigging and I mean, I just play around that day. I might use cut bait of squid, maybe some gotcha. live minnows. Um, I'll use some plastics and okay. I'll play around with the size of plastics and these plastics are usually entrenched in some kind of like juice to entice them. Well, perfect, hold that thought, sure. we're going to commercial break and we're going to come right back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, the topic, fluke. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 35th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. We're back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. The topic, flute, and I'm working with Melissa Toro. Okay, back to the jigging aspect. So there is a color, there's probably maybe two or three colors of a bucktail that I'll use when I'm jigging. And that's anywhere, I always start off with white. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not getting any bites or just maybe, you know, kind of on the smaller size of flute, I'll then switch over to a chartreuse. Mm -hmm. But I will let in on the secret. In the back bays, I've been very successful with a color that a lot of manufacturers called maybe sea robin. So it's basically kind of white with a tinge of brown in it. Mm. And for some reason, I've been doing really well. As a matter of fact, the fluke that I caught last summer had spit up some baby fluke. So I don't know if that's maybe enticing them is <laughs> the, the brown color. I prefer instead of a tinge Tail, instead of like a plastic squid tail that comes on some of the bucktails, I prefer the deer hair. I just like the, okay. so, I just so, like so the away density. From the plastic more yeah, from that's the, worked with sure. me more is the deer hair. Um, I, I like the density. I've seen underwater, you know, camera videos, and it just seems to kind of like flow better along the, you, the ocean floor. You say floor. you caught some and it spit up flukes? Yes, yeah. baby fluke, hey. yeah. How about getting one of those flukes and use it and catch it? <laughs> I felt bad. They were babies. <laughs> I think I'm from Jersey there with the regulations that you might be spending about 18 years yeah. in jail on that one. <laughs> so I try to go with the lowest bucktail weight possible. Okay. When you're in the back bays, I'm looking at a half an ounce bucktail to three fourth ounce bucktails. Okay. I mean, I rarely use a one ounce. What rare. liter pound test? It's, all. Um, I can show you right yeah, here very quickly. Yeah. Quick. So I use a high low rig. So this is an example of a high low rig. I'm using a liter 20, 25 pound okay. uh, fluoro. Um, and the bottom, this is just uh, a surgeon's loop and I put my bucktail on yep. the bottom. So this, I think this might be maybe a one ounce, a little too heavier than what I'm used to in the back base. And what do you put on the center hook? So right up here, about like 12 inches up, I put a dropper loop and I start off with my hook. If you're in the back bays, I'm looking at a three oct okay. um, bait holder. This is not a bait holder, but I do use a three oct bait holder. When I'm going out now offshore, I tend to, you have to play around with the weight of the bucktail. If I'm dropping it to the bottom and it starts to scope away mm -hmm. from the boat, I increase the weight until the scope goes right straight down. Um, and then also with jigging, I I drop it until I can feel the bottom. Okay. And I try to, I'll just crank it up just a little bit. I'm not going up too far right. up in the water column. You know, fluke lie flat along the floor mm -hmm. of the ocean, along the floors of the bay, and they just want to ambush their, their baits. So I try to leave it as slow as possible. But believe it or not, I get most of my bites on the teaser, which is above the bucktail. So, and again, what's on a teaser again? Use anything. Um, Natural bait as well, or you, you still yes, the artificial? Yes, live minnows were a huge hit last year with me. But then the year before, 
plastic, you know, imitations of minnows was also huge as well. Gotcha. So I just, I play around. I have everything. I have squid. I have live minnows. I have keelies. I have um, plastic baits, and I have them all sizes. I start off with like a three, four the, the, inch that, plastic bait. That's quite the concerted effort to go after fluke with all that. That sounds like yeah. what we'd load up to go to the Bahamas <laughs> for an offshore fishing exactly. trip. Exactly. <laughs> hey, Joe, where does, it, does it change when you're offshore? We're a bigger vessel. We're 55 feet, so we're trying to slow it down as slow as possible. You know, sometimes it depends on your anglers, but we try to slow it down so they get hung up less and making it a good productive drift over, you know, a mile area or something like okay, that. Okay, so it's just probably a real good controlled drift over that. All uh, right, very good. And before I get into subtleties with you versus the rigs, uh, you know, natural bait versus live bait, I'm going to slow you down only for about 60 seconds or so we go to commercial break. We'll be right back with the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. We will resume our fluke panel shortly. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear, stay cool and protected while fishing, JL Audio, ahead of the curve, ACR, building survival products since 1956, Florida Keys and Key West, visit FLAKeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 35th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. We're back, the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. I'm with Joe Trainer, and we're talking about fluke fishing around some of the offshore wrecks. All right, so you've got your controlled drift. Are you doing anything differently than, say, Melissa, as far as what are you dropping down? Are you more of the same setup as she is or doing something differently? Well, we get hung up a lot, so we're trying to eliminate the expense, so which would be usually just a weight and a, and a hook, and that's okay. it, single so hook. How far are up the weight from from the hook, give me an idea of, of your Now schematics. we're usually using six ounces on right. the reef, something like that, and you're, you know, you're just a dropper above there with, you know, a small, you know, just a dropper right above there and on the bottom. Now what we do differently is we have the luxury of tuna fishing probably five or six days a week, then inshore two days a week or something. Might so we have the luxury, yep. we have the luxury of tuna belly. Yep. And it's worked unbelievably for us. And it's, and it, it works great in the back too, but the, the blue crabs get you and then it's just over. Hope they're big enough. So, so yeah, that's true. With those. It's not bad either. So that's something so, that so we- So go tuna fishing first, then come in for fluke, right? It's, it's really <laughs> been unbelievably productive right. for us. Well, that's, that's good to know. All right, I wanna, with the remaining time left, I want something really short and sweet to the point here. Part of the deal in catching fluke is successfully setting a hook on them. And uh, Melissa, let's start off with you. What is the right way when you feel that you've got a fluke on that to set that hook? Is it automatic like a largemouth bass or are you more subtle with it or what? I'm more subtle with it. I don't swing towards the sky yet. I mean, I feel them eating it. I feel them ambushing the bait or the hook and everything. I feel the nibbles. So I'll just lift it a little bit, reel in a little bit so there's no slack. Yep. And then when I feel like a nice big like tug down, that's when I set the hook and I reel it in. A nice steady reel in hook. And then I usually have my friend come and net it in head first, mm -hmm. not in the rear because they'll spit that hook out. <laughs> so that's how I do it. Very good. Mike, how would you recommend your client set the hook on a, uh, a flounder? They don't set the hook on my boat. That ain't allowed. <laughs> we use circle hooks. There you go. And the, we crank it, we don't yank it. So they just crank it real soft and start reeling. It's like putting training wheels on the bicycle. Yeah. You can't mess up. So when I see somebody set the hook, I lose it. You lose them, They're, they have that little subtle jaw. So, you know, the harder you go, the more you're gonna lose. You know, you're just gonna pull it right out. Understood. Melissa, if you had to give us maybe your most crucial tip on catching fluke that you've learned in doing this, what would that be? Honestly, it's not really a technique, but move away from the fleet. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like to do. Okay, sure. so whether you're in the back bays or offshore, move away from the fleet and that pays off, even if it's a couple of yards. Look at your Simrad, make sure you're in a good area, you know, rocky bottom or muddy flats, but move away from the Basically fleet. Basically you're saying find your own zone. Exactly, and, and get away from odds. the pressure. Sure, also the reports, if they were there yesterday, does not mean- Yesterday headlines. They, they move, they, sure. they move, just like we move. So yesterday headlines, they're not there today and that's paid off. I mean, honestly, even if it's a couple of feet away from the fleet yeah. and I have scored big. And don't start screaming when you catch something big because then the fleet comes, comes to you. back to yeah. you. Sure. Be quiet. <laughs> the, another tip yep. too, the, the key, because they come off easy. So I tell my clients just to let, a, let them have it. You know, let them go ahead and eat it because you're going to eat 
the fluke anyway, or flounder. <laughs> so instead of catching them in the mouth, I let them eat it, swallow it, then we catch them in the bowl, you know. <laughs> so he ain't coming off once he swallowed. So just let them have it and eat. That's how they do it in Tampa Bay. Yeah, huh? that's how they do it in Tampa. Uh, Joe, give me a, a real quick tip for the offshore fluke in that, that if you had to drop one out there that, that you feel is very crucial, what, what would that be? God. We catch a large fluke. Give me a real quick right, one. We caught the biggest fluke I've ever caught in my life uh, December 30th, 10, 12 days ago. Okay. We were sea bass fishing 55 miles off, 34 inches. Wow. Wow. Which was, you know, 12 pound range. Yep. And we caught it while we were at the rock pile inside the Wilmington Canyon, just sea bass fishing. And he we use a little jigs, uh -huh. you know, three ounce jig, no bait at all. Uh -huh. And he says, man, this is really weird. It's something different. And next thing you know, I'm like, of course, back safely, you know, it's season's closed, but they do migrate offshore, then they come back. Oh, very, very good. Well, I could sit and talk to you for days on this. It's a very intriguing subject to me, Fluke, just because we don't have them down here in fishable numbers. But I want to thank Captain Mike Goodwine, Melissa Toro, and Joe Trainer for that session. And we will be back with our next Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Hang with us. Well, there you have it. This week's Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Now, adhering to Seminar Series tradition, you still have an opportunity for a chance to maybe win one of the many door prizes we have available. Go to nationalseminarseries.com, log on to the door prize banner, and enter your name and contact information. At the conclusion of the Seminar Series, we will computer generate the winners of those prizes. So get right down to it. Oh.